Shakespeare, birthplace, trust. Three words to think about, but what do they mean? Well, to answer this question, there's no better place to go than to our great British Midlands, to the county of Warwickshire, and to a provincial town therein called Stratford-upon-Avon, where there happens to be a registered charity and educational trust called the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. And their objectives, as written in their Articles of Incorporation, are to promote in every part of the world the advancement of Shakespearean knowledge. Interesting way of putting it, and not just uh, promoting Shakespearean knowledge, but the advancement of it. So, how do they go about doing that? Let us first meet the team. Stan, Paul, AJ and Carol. AJ is a trustee of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and one of his tasks is to coordinate what goes on online, people's online opinions of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, to set up um, numerous websites about Shakespeare, uh, to ensure that everybody agrees that the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust is a very excellent place to coordinate bloggers and websites and this sort of thing. Um, so he's the head of the tactical strike team and um, to keep to preserve the order of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and he does a very good job at it and he says of himself, he calls himself a misfit, hell-bent on changing the world. So he changes the world in this particular instance by as I say, maintaining the status quo. Um, let's meet another trustee, uh, Professor Carol Rutter. She I always think of as the stalking horse of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. That's to say that she is put out there with um, extraordinary opinions about Shakespeare to see how they run and see if people pick up and, and, and go with them. Let's have an example of that. Here's one of her opinions um, published in a Shakespeare Birthplace Trust book quite recently. On every page, in every speech, every line Shakespeare wrote, we see the mental imprint of... Can you guess it? Every page, every speech, every line that Shakespeare wrote, can you guess what we see the mental imprint of? Genius, perhaps? No. The grammar school, she says. Um, well, as we know, there's no... Uh, Contemporary evidence saying he went to any school at all, let alone a grammar school, but um, very useful in her eyes to see that in every line, every page, every speech, we see the mental imprint of it. So that's Carol Rutter, one of the trustees. Um, this is Honorary President Professor Sir Stanley Wells, a very, very long history of association with the Birthplace Trust, um, and he is, in a way, the eminence grise, the figurehead of the whole thing. He, like Carol Rutter, has a lot of extraordinary, um, let's say, controversial opinions. In fact, in, a, in an online uh, discussion with her, he is seen to be saying about history, it is dangerous and immoral to question history. Um, I'm not sure that would get him very far if he were a 15-year-old today trying to sit what we call the GCSE history examination. That's what all 15-year-olds in England have to sit. Um, the uh, objectives as laid down by the Department of Education, by the government for GCS history, known as assessment objectives, they state pupils must investigate issues critically and question reliability, bias, provenance and context. So to be a good historian today you need to question history. Well I'm not saying that Professor Wells is a historian at all, actually he's an English literature professor, but nonetheless um, um, he is in a strange way seems to be accusing the uh, Department of Education and all those wonderful history teachers throughout the country of dangerous immorality as they train their, uh, their pupils to question history, the reliability, bias, provenance and context. Um, so here's a man who doesn't really get history in the normal sense, um, and yet he has a lot to say about uh, Shakespeare, and Shakespeare is clearly a historical matter. And of course in history one of the ways to understand a, a, a person, if you're trying to write a historical account of someone, is to go back to what their contemporaries said about them. So let's have a look at how Stanley Wells um, deals with what the contemporaries of Shakespeare said about um, Shakespeare. 
Robert Greene in 1592, you might uh, remember, calls Shakespeare an upstart crow in a, in a, in a work called uh, Groatsworth of Wit. Actually, I don't think he's talking about Shakespeare at all. He's talking about someone else called Robert Allen. But, um, um, sorry, uh, Allen, sorry, Edward Allen, who's the actor. But Professor Wells thinks he's talking about Shakespeare, and he discusses the cryptic nature of this um, allusion. A book called Willoughby, His Avisa, published in 1594, um, discusses Shake hyphen Spear, who paints poor Lucrece Rape. Um, Professor Wells says that the author of this is being deliberately cryptic. Um, William Covell in 1595, in a work called Polymantia, um, talks about Shakespeare. Um, and if you want to know what he's actually saying about Shakespeare, you can look at my upload William Covell knew but Stanley Wells writes of this allusion he says certainly the author was deliberately being cryptic I have no solution to the puzzles he poses so he can't understand that cryptic allusion to Shakespeare in 1595 um, nor really can he understand um, what John Weaver is saying about William Shakespeare in 1599 in a famous epigram Ad Gulelum Shakespeare um, which uh, Stanley Wells says uh, Weaver is describing Shakespeare somewhat cryptically um, just with Anthony Scolica in 1604 in a, in a work called Diophantus where he talks about friendly Shakespeare and Again, Stanley Wells is, uh, is a bit bemused by this. He calls it a cryptic allusion. Uh, John Davis of Hereford in 1611 wrote another epigram about Shakespeare, and some of you will know it. Um, it's entitled um, To Our English Terence, Mr. William Shakespeare, Master William Shakespeare. And uh, Stanley Wells says this is a cryptic ep epigram, somewhat obscure in its elusiveness. Um, many of you will be aware also of the um, monument at Stratford-upon-Avon to William Shakespeare, put there probably around 1619, and Professor Stanley Wells says that that somewhat cryptically calls upon the passerby to pay tribute to his greatness as a writer. So you'll see there's a theme here, Stanley Wells seeing a lot of the contemporaries talking about Shakespeare and saying that they are all being cryptic. Well, what does cryptic mean? It comes from the Greek uh, kruptain, to hide, or kruptos, meaning hidden or secret. So Stanley Wells has spotted something important here, that all Shakespeare's contemporaries are talking in a hidden or secret way about him. Uh, so what he needs to do next, obviously, is to try and answer the question what it was about William Shakespeare that was prohibited from overt expression by his contemporaries. And while he's trying to work that out, um, let's have a look at how he does actually deal uh, with the history of Shakespeare, the biography. Now remember that uh, Stanley Wells says it is dangerous and immoral to question history, and remember also that he uh, doesn't understand most of the contemporary references to Shakespeare because he calls them cryptic, so they've got something hidden about them. So he is a bit straight-jacketed, poor fellow. But never mind, he, he gives a good shot at it um, in an article called What Was He, i.e. Shakespeare, What Was He Really Like? published in Critical Survey, which is um, a very uh, upmarket academic journal back in 2009. What was he really like? As a baby, he howled and wept, says Sir Stanley. He smiled and laughed. He played games with his siblings and was irritated when they could not keep time in their recorder playing. He walked to and from school with his satchel on his back. He learnt to swim and ride a horse, and he struggled with Latin grammar. He ate and drank, belched and farted, urinated and defecated. As adolescence came on, he began to experience erections and to feel desire. He masturbated, and earlier than most of his contemporaries copulated. So that's the uh, high professorial tone which we get, and uh, high understanding of Shakespeare from Professor Stanley Wells. Um, the last member of the team I want to introduce is this cheeky chappy. Um, he's the reverend, he's actually a priest, you wouldn't guess it from his garb, Dr. Paul Edmondson, whose job title at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust is Head of Knowledge and Research. A very important sounding title to be Head of Knowledge, um, in charge of all the sort of facts concerning Shakespeare. 
Um, how does he deal with them? Well, in his own words, he says, my approach to the facts and historical evidence is complex and is informed by deep knowledge in order to understand them. So he approaches these facts in a very, very complex way with his deep knowledge. Um, perhaps even my attempt there to, to, to explain what he's what he's saying is, is not helping. Let's let's have a look then at how he how this approach, this complex approach to the facts and historical data is done by the Reverend Paul Edmondson. Here is a double page spread of um, an article which he wrote in a book that he also edited with Professor Stanley Wells, uh, which is published under the auspices of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. Now, this piece then written by Paul Edmondson, so, and with his complex approach to the facts, let's have a look at the sort of things he is saying. And he says um, Nicholas Bland uh, was the man who owned the plot of land upon which the Globe Theatre was built. Um, actually, his name is... is, is Nicholas Brend, but um, let's not worry too much about that. Um, he says, Hemming stood as a trustee for Shakespeare's purchase of the Blackfriars Gatehouse. Uh, both men were referred to as of great living wealth and power. Well, of course, Shakespeare was never never referred to as that. Um, Hemmings may be, but not Shakespeare. Uh, when they were sued by um, John Witter, uh, Shakespeare was never sued by... Uh, John Witter uh, on the 20th of April, well, what's what's a day between friends? Um, Shakespeare inherited his coat of arms in 1601. Um, of course, you inherit a coat of arms um, really as soon as you're born, so long as your father's on address. Um, so actually 1596 is, is, is the correct date for that. It's not, nothing to do with the death of his father. Um, uh, Shakespeare acted in Ben Jonson's Every Man in His Humour in 1598. Um, actually, that's the wrong, the wrong play and the wrong year. Um, what else have we got here on the next page? Hemings, Condell and Shakespeare among nine king's men listed on a receipt for scarlet cloth. Um, well, I wish it were a receipt. That would have been something, obviously, that Shakespeare held in his hand. But um, no, it's 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 an account book actually of the uh, master of the wardrobe, um, not a receipt. Uh, the cloth was granted by royal patent. Um, that's a very funny idea. I mean, you no, know, you just give out cloth. You don't create a royal patent to grant cloth. Um, on the seventeenth of May, sixteen o three. No, this this is all to do with something in March, sixteen o four. This when the when cloth was given to uh, the king's men. So. Not quite right there. Um, for liveries at James the First coronation, well, no, March 1604 is when the cloth was given out. James the coronation was actually back in. He was already king, so he was he was crowned in in July 1603. Anyway, I think you're getting the idea. What we're looking at here is this the head of knowledge and his approach to the facts and historical evidence being so complex. And I think we've now got an idea of how that complexity works. Um, essentially. Um, putting out facts that, well, judge for yourself. Um, so they're, they're thick as thieves, these two, Stanley and uh, Paul Edmondson, and they have, uh, there you see them in a sort of fancy dress. A lot of fancy dress goes on in Stratford-upon-Avon, and, and so nothing peculiar about that necessarily, the endless pictures of people in Morris dancing costume and things like that. Um, but here we see the two of them who have edited quite a number of books together, one called Shakespeare, Beyond Doubt, uh, the one I was just showing you just now called The Shakespeare Circle, uh, one called Shakespeare Was Shakespeare. And um, they are soi disant expert authorities and they disdain, um, deplore, one might say, anyone who challenges their expo uh, expert authority. In fact, uh, Sir Paul, uh, Paul Edmondson has written, uh, deploring the assumption that it is always acceptable to challenge or contradict a knowledgeable and expert authority. It is not. So very much in line with uh, Sir Stanley's view that uh, it's dangerous and immoral uh, to question history. And it's also unacceptable to contradict a knowledgeable and expert um, authority. Uh, dangerous indeed if you do and um, in their own words they've put this in print those those who do challenge 
expert authority, their own expert authority, have described as parasitic, leech-like bloodsuckers, anti-Shakespeareans who feed off the lifeblood of healthy bodies. Um, and Stanley Wells says that they are suffering from psychological aberration and certifiable madness. Um, these are the people who have the audacity, the immorality, uh, to question uh, their complex approach to the facts. Um, so we've met the team. What is the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust doing? What's its main activity? Well, its main activity actually is promoting a number of properties. very rich. It owns a lot of property, particularly in and around Stratford-upon-Avon. And some, but by no means all of those properties, are open to the ticket-buying public. Um, so they are set up actually by um, an act of parliament which gives them the right to take money off, off people to come and see these museums. And they're described as the Shakespeare houses. Let's have a quick look at them. They're, the pride and joy, of course, is this one, known as the birthplace uh, in Henley Street in Stratford-upon-Avon. And the Birthplace Trust advertises this. Uh, this is the house where William Shakespeare was born, grew up and played. He ate meals in the hall and slept and dreamt in these rooms. I don't know whether that uh, sentence is written by Sir Stanley Wells, but if it is, I think we might thank him for excluding the fact that uh, this is the house where he... Um, uh, had erections and uh, wet dreams or whatever he was trying to say about him earlier. Um, this house, is it actually the house where Shakespeare was born? Um, did Shakespeare even actually ever live here? Well, we know that um, William Shakespeare of Stratford, his father was called John, and that we know that John Shakespeare um, owned property on the north side of Henley Street, which is marked there. Um, what is claimed as the birthplace of William Shakespeare is uh, there on the map. Um, what's the actual historical evidence? Well, in 1552, we have a document saying that a John Shakespeare, and I say a John Shakespeare because there was more, more than one in the town at the time, so it's a little bit confusing about which one was the father of William, uh, but a John Shakespeare was making a stink in Latin, called a sterquinarium, uh, at his premises in Henley Street. But the document doesn't say which premises and exactly where it was, so we don't really know about that. Um, a few years later, uh, 1556, again we have a John Shakespeare, could be the father of William, not totally sure, but could be, um, who buys two properties, one in Greenhill Street, which I'm afraid is not on this map, so I can't point it out to you, and the other one in Henley Street. The one in Greenhill Street is much nicer and uh, posher and is described as having a garden and croft, which is an enclosure and appurtenances. And so it's obviously a rather nice place to live. Um, we don't know whether John Shakespeare lived in Greenhill Street, although that's the most probable, or the other little place he bought in Henley Street. And we don't know where the Henley Street place was. Now, in 1575, and don't forget that's 11 years after the birth of William Shakespeare of Stratford, we have another document saying that John Shakespeare buys two properties in Henley Street, thought to be two contiguous properties, um, but that's 1575, so he's only just bought them, so pretty unlikely, I would say. Uh, that William Shakespeare was born in either of them. And these are uh, properties that are now said to be the um, Shakespeare birthplace. But actually, um, someone went in 1760 on a little pilgrimage to Stratford-on-Avon looking for Shakespeare's birthplace and said there was none and no one in the town could point to anything being Shakespeare's birthplace. Nine years later, uh, 1769, this flamboyant fellow who's an actor called David Garrick, decided to set up a great festival of Shakespeare at Stratford-upon-Avon and went there and was very dismayed to find no birthplace. Um, and, of course, Greenhill Street, the most likely place, um, didn't exist anymore. So he went to Henley Street and uh, started saying that this uh, place, this little funny little shack here, um, was the place where Shakespeare was born and he was supported in this by two locals, one who drew a picture of it, much aggrandised, of course, because they didn't like the idea of him really coming from a tiny, tiny place like this. 
um, and another one who drew a map and stuck a thing saying Shakespeare's birthplace on that map, but it was very much contested at the time. Um, when the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust bought this little place in 1847, it was described as a filthy remnant of a butcher's shamble, which of course is all it is. Um, there's a picture of it in 1814, uh, so a tiny little house with sort of one window at the top. Not the sort of place that you really imagine uh, the author of Hamlet and Othello and uh, that have come from. Didn't, didn't mean he couldn't have come from a place like that, but um, we know that uh, none of his family was literate and it seems a bit unlikely. And it's not just unlikely to me and, and non-Stratfordians, it's actually unlikely to Stratfordians and it caused a rather problem. And that problem's been going back a very long time. A local historian in 1788 called this little house a most flagrant and gross imposition invented purposely with a design to extort pecuniary gratuities from the credulous and the unwary. Um, so in other words, it was it was a con um, filled with little bits of relic and a chair that Shakespeare was supposed to have sat in and a mug he was supposed to have drunk out of. And the curator called herself Mrs Shakespeare and claimed to be a descendant, and it was all absolute rubbish. Actually, in fairness to the, the Birthplace Trust, Dr Levi Fox, who was director of the Birthplace Trust, said, wrote in 1947, the records do not indicate precisely at what house in Stratford-upon-Avon William was born. So it's well known we don't really know where he's born. Um, however, um, things have got slightly more out of hand. Um, here's a picture from 1856, and you can see now there's a big sign outside the little sh shamble there saying the birthplace of Shakespeare. Um, so, and, and money was coming in, and you, you must never, never underestimate the force and the excitement of money. And obviously so many people coming into this tiny shamble, they needed to expand it and... Uh, so expand it, they did. So there's the there's the shamble, which couldn't fit all the tourists and couldn't accommodate all the cash coming in. And so the Birthplace Trust uh, also bought the little little house to the side of it and also bought this pub, um, the Swan Maidenhead. And you can see that's of, of, of a later date, later construction. Um, but to get around this little problem, they just said, oh, well, it's been clad in brick at some later stage. And in fact, it runs flush with the with the shamble behind it, and all the old timbers are there. Ho ho ho! Well, obviously, I don't think there's anyone looking at this picture who'd believe that for a second. But never mind. Um, so what did they do? They took the shamble, uh, pretty well knocked the whole thing down, and reconstructed it into this um, rather monstrous site. Um, the roof tiles are 20th century, the, the fence in front is sort of 20th century as well, but everything else you can be assured, all the timbers, the windows, the window panes, the doors, uh, the mullions, the, um, those gables, all the three gables. In fact, every single thing you can see there um, dates from between 1858 and 1864, and that also applies to the back and to the inside of the house. Uh, where all the rooms have uh, sort of been rearranged. So, so the whole thing is is mid uh, mid second half of the nineteenth century, uh, in which we're told this house is where William Shakespeare was born, grew up, and played. He ate his meals. Don't think so. So Sidney Lee actually said the only part of it that that, that remains from what was originally there are the cellars. Um, there's the sort of fantastical back, uh, designed by the the son of um, who was it, Charles. I better not go there because the, the name's escaping me, but the, a famous architect, I think, designed the Houses of Parliament, and his son um, was the one who designed that. Um, here's a very honourable fellow indeed. He, he was given the job of uh, put in charge of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and he and his wife came and were curators to that birthplace museum. Um, and he wrote in... Uh, 1891, we had not held our office more than a few months before we discovered that not a single one of the many so-called relics on exhibition could be proved to be Shakespeare's, nay, that the birthplace itself is a matter of grave doubt. I resigned, he wrote, because I lost faith. The so-called traditions and legends of the place, they are for the most part an abomination and must stink in the nostrils of every true lover of our divine poet. This great man, uh, uh, Joseph Skipsey, of course, became the, the centre of Henry James's story, the birthplace. Henry James very affected by by the 
dishonesty really that was being portrayed there. Oh, so we looked at the birthplace. Um, this uh, one people pay dearly to go and have a look at is known as Anne Hathaway's Cottage. Very quaint, nice little cottage and advertised by the Birthplace Trust. Discover where the young William Shakespeare courted his future bride, Anne Hathaway, at her picturesque family home. Um, is it actually her family home? Um, this uh, first came up as an idea when a wheelwright and a known con man fraud called um, Jordan claimed it to be uh, Anne Hathaway's birthplace in 1790. Um, but he didn't produce a single shred of uh, supporting documentary evidence and all of the scholars at the time, Malone and uh, uh, Chalmers and such like, um, a few bit later, um, uh, denounced it and said, and said this, is, this is rubbish and has no basis in any fact uh, whatsoever. But of course, it didn't stop the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust from buying it and then making a great effort to try and show that it was the house where Anne Hathaway was born. Um, and brought up. Well, we we don't have uh, any knowledge of this, and the closest the we've ever managed to get is to say, well, the area of Shottery had a place, we don't know exactly which place it was, but it was called Hewlands, that in 1610, note that date, in 1610 was bought by someone called Bartholomew Hathaway, and Bartholomew Hathaway had a sister called Agnes. And is it possible then that Agnes was the Anne Hathaway who married Shakespeare of Stratford. Um, I think we just don't know, and, and it's very, very unlikely. And I've, I've written a script of how the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust really should advertise this place instead of just saying, um, come and discover where Shakespeare courted his wife. I think you need to say something a bit more cautious. A property here or near here, known as Hewlands, was bought by one Bartholomew Hathaway, alias Gardner, in 1610. There's another funny fact about them, they called themselves Gardner. We like to think that his sister Agnes, alias Gardner, married William Shakespeare 28 years earlier, but Agnes and Anne are totally different names. In fact, this was proven by a court of law at the time that they were not interchangeable names. We have no idea if this house was Hewlands or if Agnes Hathaway Gardner married Shakespeare in 1581 under the assumed name of Anne. Uh, but it's the best we can come up with. Sorry, that's, I think, a lighter way of putting the advertising. Um, so, no, I think it, it's, it's most likely that Anne Hathaway was a different Hathaway from a different branch of Hathaways. Could have been related, could not. Um, actually, the will of Shakespeare's granddaughter leaves things to Hathaways, who are obviously kins, kinsfolk of hers, and they clearly are not the Hathaway gardeners. So even if this property were Hewlands, which we don't know who it was, which was bought by Bartholomew Hath Hathaway in 1610, um, it's very, very unlikely that his sister Agnes was the same as Anne. So not very good, really, that um, Nash's house. I can hardly bother to talk about this one. Um, just to say that um, the idea of the Shakespeare Press was to charge, charge you money to go in to see Nash's house. Well, Nash, who was Shakespeare's son-in-law, uh, Shakespeare of Stratford's son-in-law, he, he never lived in that house, so it's sort of a waste of time from the start. Um, this is another one, um, very interesting one, called Mary Arden's House. Mary Arden, you'll remember, was the uh, mother, that's her maiden name, the mother of William Shakespeare of Stratford. And for a very, very long time, the Birthplace Trust charged uh, large amounts of money. They bought it in 1930, this house, and charged a lot of money for people to go in saying, look, Mary Arden's house, come and see where Shakespeare's mother was born and brought up. This is quite peculiar of them because um, in 1886, the leading scholar of Shakespeare for the whole century, James Orchard Hallowell Phillips, had written of this house, amongst the Shakespearean delusions that have too long mocked the enthusiasm of the unwary tourist, perhaps the most remarkable is the pretended identification of a certain old farmhouse at Wilmercott on the sole authority of a notorious imposter with that which was the birthplace and subsequently part of the dowry of Mary Arden. So, He's calling it um, uh, a delusion to, to mock the enthusiasm of unwary tourists. Why would the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust want to buy a delusion that mocked the enthusiasm of the unwary tourist, I wonder? Uh, well, the answer is obviously uh, money comes into this. 
Um, so Halliwell Phillips wrote that in 1886 and proved beyond any doubt whatsoever that this house belonged to a person called Adam Palmer. Um, five years after he'd written this in the most famous book written about Shakespeare, so it should have been, you would have thought, known to the Shakespeare birthplace trustees, even though their approach to the facts and evidence is complex, they should have known it. But uh, five years later, in 1891, by Act of Parliament, they are entitled to pursue buying this house. Actually, it doesn't come on the market for 40 years, and they buy it in 1930, knowing full well that it is nothing to do with Mary Arden. Um, here's a recent uh, photo shot from one of their websites, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and welcoming you to Mary Arden's Farm, it's now being called. There is so much to see and do at Mary Arden's farm. Step back in time for all the sights, smells and sounds of a real Tudor farm. Well, it's obviously not a real Tudor farm. It's a, it's a modern one. But anyway, sights, smells and sounds. Could be, and explore the house where Shakespeare's mother, Mary Arden, grew up. And there's the caption, Mary Arden's farm. And there you see some fancy costumed women chopping onions um, in Adam Palmer's house, in the kitchen of Adam Palmer's house. Now, it's interesting that this deception is carrying on because um, in the year 2000, the uh, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust actually came clean and said, whoops, we've only just realised that the house actually is Adam Palmer's house and has nothing to do with Mary Arden. In fact, it was uh, built in 1569, which is four years after William Shakespeare was born. So how on earth his mother was supposed to have been born and brought up in it is inconceivable. So they said, whoops, we've made a mistake. Um, it's actually Adam Palmer's house, so it doesn't stop them um, captioning it Mary Arden's farm here, however. Um, so what they did is in uh, 1967, they bought this Victorian farmhouse very close by and um, produced a paper with no credible evidence in it that I could find. Uh, which says, actually this, we got it wrong, sorry, this this is Mary Arden's house, uh, after all, Glebe Farm, and they now claim, built by Mary Arden's father around 1514, Mary Arden's house has been significantly altered over time. Indeed it has, as you can see, it's a Victorian um, building, and there is no evidence, of course, whatsoever that it was built in 1514, or around 1514, by Mary Arden's father. So much for that one. Um, coming to an end of this, uh, there are, uh, as you can see, five very important houses all, all getting money here from the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. So would you pay to go and see this one called Hall's Croft? Uh, good ticket money to go in. Would you do that? I don't know. Um, wander through the elegant home of Susanna Shakespeare and her husband, Dr. John Hall, says the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust advertisement. Um... Uh, there's no evidence at all that this was um, the house of Dr. John Hall, not one single uh, shred. Um, in the late 19th century, it was called Hall Croft. And actually, if you go to almost any town in England, you'll find that there is a place called Hall Croft. Hall Croft just means a, a, a big room or space with a croft, which is an enclosure behind it. And uh, as I say, most towns in England have a Hall Croft, and Stratford was no exception. Um, but some clever clogs and um, Shakespeare fanatic, I think called Mary Corelli was the one where I may be wrong, uh, put the apostrophe on it, Hall's Croft and said, oh, this is that, obviously, Hall's Croft is called after John Hall, because he lived there. Um, well, that's a bit of sleight of hand. Um, what you're actually looking at now um, is looks nice and old and quaint. It's um, basically 1951, I would say. And it's the reconstruction of a Victorian uh, mock Tudor house uh, built by some people called Croker in the 1880s. Um, the original Hall's Croft. Um, you can see a picture of it here, very different style and everything. It was actually a school called Cambridge House, I think a school for girls. Um, well, you can see the, probably what's the enclosure of the Croft behind it. Um, and anyway, it, it burnt down in a fire in, in 1871, 
And then it was then that the Crocus bought it and turned it into a mock Tudor, very fashionable mock Tudor in the 1880s, and particularly in Stratford upon Avon, of course, for its um, associations with Shakespeare. So you'll find in Stratford upon Avon far more um, things pretending to be Tudor actually built in the 19th century than almost any other town in England. This is no exception. Um, so again, I think uh, if I were organising the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust's advertising, I would. Do, you know, do it a bit better, I'd probably say something like, welcome to this bogus house, which has absolutely nothing to do with Shakespeare or his family or his times. We hope you spend lots of money in the cafe and gift shop. Customers who purchase items to the value of £10 or more may also use the lavatory. Something nice and friendly to, to get people in, because obviously it's a bit off-putting being told it's a bogus um, 1951 house, so you need to get them in on, in on other ways. And using the lavatory, you'll find a lot of tourists really go to tourist sites primarily to, to use the lavatory. So that might get them in, despite the fact. But don't don't go on saying it's John Hall's house. There's no evidence whatsoever for that. Um, OK, so talking of money and, uh, you know, these sort of gift shops and things, that's another way that the Birthplace Trust makes a lot of money. Here's a portrait of Sir Thomas Overbury, a courtier, a very noble and, and good man. Um, he had a horrible end. He was betrayed by his closest and most intimate friend uh, called Robert Carr and uh, sent to the Tower of London where he was poisoned. And this became uh, a notorious scandal at the time. And after his death in 1613, Overbury became very famous and um, many copies were made of his portrait and other portraits circulated um, and often referring to this this terrible event. Here's uh, an engraving, very typical Thomas Overbury written around the outside. The oil painting on the left, by the way, is in the Bodleian Library. It also has Overbury's name on it. Um, and this engraving on the right here, this uh, it, it alludes to the terrible false friendship that led to his death. Of a false friend like mine, man that scarce hath read. Uh, and this became a theme on many of the copies, the popular copies of, of portraits of him. Um, this one here um, says Principum Amicitias at the top, you can see. And that is a reference to Horace Ode's two, Gravisque Principum Amicitias, referring to the deadly friendships of princes. So again, it's a, it's a reference to the terrible way that Sir Thomas Overbury died. Why am I going on about Thomas Overbury? We're meant to be talking about the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. Here's another portrait of um, Thomas Overbury. Um, this way, one actually found itself found its way into the Folger Shakespeare Library uh, in Washington D.C., where it was bought um, as a portrait of Shakespeare. And in those days, it had a bald head because someone had altered it to make it look more like Shakespeare. But the Folger is is not uh, uh, an entirely dishonest organization, and they now say that they accept it is um, Thomas Overbury, not Shakespeare, that portrait. Um, here is. Uh, Honorary President of Sir Stanley Wells of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, looking at this picture of Thomas Overbury, um, which he uh, declares a portrait from the life of William Shakespeare. Very, um, he's not an art expert, and as we can see, he's not a historian either. But anyway, his, he is Professor Sir Stanley Wells, so people take what he says quite seriously. Um, and it does, of course, help that another copy of this painting uh, was bought in 2011 by the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, so they own their own one, and it's, it's wonderful to have it authenticated by Sir Stanley as a portrait from the life. The Shakespeare Birthplace Trust says it is 90% sure that Shakespeare of Stratford, although no courtier, sat in courtier's costumes um, to be painted like this. Um, so there's Sir Stanley staring straight at the portrait, of course, of Thomas Overy, a portrait from the life of William Shakespeare, 90% sure. Um, and if you go to the Shakespeare Birth Birthplace Trust website, you can buy limitless images of this uh, to, to fill the coffers from a little uh, portrait postcard for 50p all the way to a £55 framed Shakespeare portrait. Just press add to cart and the money comes rolling in for Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, as it does indeed uh, for this signet ring. Um, Actually, 1756 was the first time a W.S. signet ring was said to be Shakespeare's. It was put on uh, exhibition by David Garrick, the actor I was talking about earlier. And, of course, something like uh, gold, um, uh, something that's been written on gold, is very, very difficult to, to date properly. Well, one of them seemed to drop down the trouser leg of someone in a field in 
in Stratford upon Avon, and it's a WS. And the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust has given licenses to Pragnall, the jewellers, and um, making money out of that too. And yes, yeah, so you can you can buy a copy of this William Shakespeare signet ring. Of course, never used. We, we um, on his will he doesn't use it as a seal. Um, if he had a, a a ring, one would imagine he would put his crest on it, not not just his initials. But there you have it. Um, you can buy that from anything between fifteen hundred pounds or three thousand eight hundred pounds. Um, another bit of superb um, licensing from the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and look look at the portraits of Thomas Overbury to sort of give it a certain um, imprimatur. So Thomas Overbury says that this is definitely William Shakespeare's signet ring. Uh, the original signet ring found in the field is in the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust archives. Um, okay, we have created the Shakespeare-inspired brand to develop the range of products that reflect the Trust's values, expertise, and collections, they say. So that's the Trust's values there. So money, 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 money. It's obviously the most important thing for them. Actually, I was involved um, a couple of years ago in a project to offer the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust um, £40,000 for the opportunity to defend their idea that Shakespeare of Stratford was the author of the William Shakespeare plays in front of a court of neutral judges. Um, I have never heard of a registered charity and an educational trust turning down £40,000 or any figure near it uh, for the opportunity to defend the whole basis upon which the the trust and the charity is, is, is set up. Uh, but they did turn it down, and I think we can probably all guess why. If you can't guess why they turned down, um, I recommend you, to you a book uh, that I wrote myself, Shakespeare in Court. You can buy that. It's a Kindle single. You can buy that on Amazon. And that um, uh, takes the trial um, as it would have happened if they had had the courage to... The Shakespeare Birthplace Trust had had the courage to to do the trial and accept the forty thousand pounds offer if they could if they could prove that Shakespeare Stratford one uh, wrote those plays. Um, so you can get that on Amazon or in a two CD set. You can um, get it from the De Vere Society, which is done as a sort of radio play. Um, in either case, I concluded in that since the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust makes full statement, it's about its tourist museums, conceals information about Shakespeare authorship, abuses those who challenge its expert authority, has a clear and obvious conflict of interests concerning its revenues and its representation of Shakespeare in history. We should take all of its ex cathedra pronouncements, everything pushed by its guides, its trustees, its communications department, and especially by its head of knowledge and its honorary president, with a very large pinch of salt. So, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust... Three words to think about. What do they mean? Well, judging by the activities over the last hundred years of the registered charity in Stratford-upon-Avon, I think those three words can be soundly said to mean absolutely nothing at all. Thank you. <laughs>